nicest car is the most honest car you ever see. It's been a dream ever since I've had it. The first time I heard that engine screaming, I thought, I gotta have one of those. For me, the cars have personality. What's great about a BMW Classic is the community that surrounds it. When you listen to that, <laughs> that's why we're here. Welcome to Classic Heart, the BMW Group Classic Podcast. This is JP, and our guest today is Matt Schwartz. Matt, good morning. Where do we find you today? Good morning. We're in Los Angeles today. So, Matt, it would be cool if you tell us a little bit about you, because it doesn't make sense if I always tell the stories, because you know yourself much better. And so <laughs> tell us, what is your daily job? Uh, what are you doing? Anything. Man, I hope I know myself well. Um, <laughs> my daily job, I'm an engineer at actually an automotive software company. Mm -hmm. So we make uh, shop management systems. So independent repair shops, you know, when you take your vehicle in for service, if you need to get your, you know, ticket written up where they write up, you know, their oil change or your, you know, brake job or whatever, it's the actual system that they write the services up in. But it's meant to be like a 21st century you know, solution because it's all on the cloud and you can text and email and stuff like that. It's called shopware. It's my my day job. Yes. Um, you know, a couple of things on the side. Everybody in, in the States has some kind of side hustle. Um, I had a long history working in the the eyewear industry. So okay. I made glasses for a long time. Oh, really? Yeah, kind of random. Um, I actually found that there's a lot of similarities between eyewear and cars. What is that? Well, we'll get into this, but one of the reasons I kind of fell in love with cars, specifically classic cars, is because there's an element of creativity and art and expression in them because there's obviously a design that, you know, somebody penned. And then there's the technology aspect of it, which obviously is getting more advanced every year. And I kind of liked that mixture. And to me, eyewear was the most basic version of that cross, right, mm -hmm. of that intersection, because... You know, when somebody wears a pair of glasses, it's kind of like a piece of jewelry for their face, right? They're they're putting something on that's an expression of their sense of style, but the actual lens itself, the thing that somebody sees through is inherently extremely technical. Yes, true. So yeah, I had a, a long history in the eyewear industry until it basically ran me dry. But um, <laughs> so that's how I got into software. Uh, but I'm working on another brand that's actually automotive inspired, which I, I haven't launched yet. But uh, so I don't know if I want to say too much, but it's it's automotive inspired. Let's put it that way. I mean, now you got us curious, to be honest. Um, oh, gosh. So can you just share a little bit just to give us a tiny hint? So I, I can't say any specific brands, but effectively what we're doing is recycling old body panels into eyewear. Oh, wow. Yeah, we, we like the idea of a story. And, you know, there are, there are old cars that, you know, they for some reason are off the road. Yeah. So why can't we repurpose them into something with a new story? So we, we hope to, you know, every body panel we recycle, we hope to get the whole story of the vehicle with it and you know, present that to the owner of the pair of sunglasses so that they know what they're wearing on their face and where it comes from. I'm sure people love this kind of story. They really love these things where they have can say, okay, you know, I have these glasses. This has been an X and Y body panel uh, with that history, one ownership for 25 years or 35 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of story. That's very interesting. So we cannot wait. We don't want to go any further that you have the chance to really sure. push this out before anyone else comes to that idea and copy it. So, um, but that sounds very exciting. So there is an automotive red line, no, not a red line, but like a logic in your life, isn't it? It seems that way. I try and have some other hobbies. I'm a musician also, but, you know, somehow it always comes back to classic cars and I guess that's not a bad thing. It's good to have a hobby. But, you know, I ended up in the automotive industry in software by accident. So it okay. just kind of How did fell you get into there, place. Then? I just applied on LinkedIn. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I think having knowledge of the industry helped a lot. You know, it's, yeah. it wasn't a secret that I, you know, knew what this was about. And I think that helped, certainly. You know, it's not like I was applying to some cybersecurity thing and I didn't know sure. anything about cybersecurity. It's like I knew the industry. So for them, it was probably an easy hire. <laughs> Very good. Um, would you say that you were born into an automotive crazy family? 
I wouldn't use the word crazy, but mm -hmm. yeah, I would think so. It was, it was kind of the same thing. It was kind of, you know, pervasive. I was born into a family where my dad used to work for BMW dealers back in the day, and he worked for Recaro USA. Oh, wow. And while he was working at Recaro USA, he met my mother, who mm -hmm. was working for an advertising agency with Recaro's advertising, um, but she was always in automotive advertising. So yeah, my dad always had, I mean, as long as I can remember, always had a fun car. So I was kind of born into it, yeah. So what is your earliest memory when it comes to cars? So the car that basically got me into this and is imprinted in my brain is my father's 1969 Lotus Elan. Yes. Um, you know, what a considered car. one of the greatest handling cars of all time. And he still has it. We're actually very close to finishing. I mean, I'll call it a frame off restoration, but it wasn't really. You could basically get a new chassis for those pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is a replacement part for that car. We yeah. didn't do any of the body, but we had the motor rebuilt. And we got a new chassis, new suspension, and we built it up like Lego pieces. But he's had that car since, I think, 1985. And I was born a little after that. So my yes. earliest memory, frankly, was riding in the passenger seat. And he used to have the the tonneau cover yeah. snapped in. And I would ride under the cover. So wow. that's, that's my earliest memory for me. And I remember one time we had to... We were at the movie theater or something, and we had to pick somebody else up. And it's only a two-seater, but there's this big spot right here between the seats that's like the backbone of the chassis. And we put one of my friends there. We just drove the three of us. And, you know, that was when you could get away with that stuff. But Absolutely. The Lotus is my earliest car memory. What color is the Lotus? It's red, which oh. is unfortunately my least favorite color, especially on a convertible. But... You know, it is what it is. I don't think it was my dad's first choice of color either, but he kind of fell into that car also. Okay. So. But Matt, would you say that this, is this really like a father and son project? Could you say that? Like, do you both work on the car or did you also like outsource some things? Yeah, I would say it is inherently a father-son project. I mean, there are certain things on it that he'll do by himself because he doesn't need more hands. Yeah. But, you know, he was just gone for the weekend and I ended up going down there and doing some stuff on it just because I felt like it. But yeah, I mean, when the engine came out, I think I helped him pull the block. We did that together and then we got the engine back and we were getting ready to put it in, but you can see the chassis in the engine bay when you're, you yeah. know, when the motor's not there. And I look and I said, doesn't that look like a crack? Like right where the engine mount is, there was a crack in the chassis. And he said, yeah, it kind of does. And I said, well, shouldn't we do something about that? And I kind of guilted him <laughs> into, into taking the body shell off and getting a new chassis. So, you know, I, I feel a little responsible for us spending a little bit more money on it. Um, yeah, it's definitely a father-son project. And we have a few, unfortunately. Okay. And what I like to say now is that Lotuses are like arts and crafts, whereas like German cars are like Legos. Yeah. Especially, I mean, this car is fiberglass body shell. So, you know, you're literally painting on resin and using, you know, fiber mat. And it's, it's an arts and crafts project. It's the car is yeah. almost made out of paper mache in some respects. Yeah. So it's more of like, how creative can you be to get these two things to fit together? Whereas, you know, I look at a German car like a 2002 and there's only one way, <laughs> right? You, you look at the manual and it specifically says, this is how this piece goes here. Yeah, um, <laughs> It's very Germanic in that regard. Yeah. Like sometimes we're on working on the Lotus and I'm thinking, God, I would love for this to be a 2002 right yeah. now because it would be so much easier. But yes. then there's times with the 2002 where you're like, oh, I, I wish I could, you know, make some bracket out of some weird, you know, metal shaving. And that's basically what we do in the Lotus. I think that's very like a very good comparison. And I think you're the right one to do this, to compare these two cars, because you own also 2002. Is that right? Yeah. Technically 1600 by VIN number, but it's, I call it a 2002. Okay. Yeah. And oh. that car I've had since I was 15 years old. Oh, really? So how did that came into your possession? So I was starting to learn to drive. I think when I was 14, my dad started teaching me. So this whole yeah. thing is totally hereditary. <laughs> he started teaching me on a stick, on a manual. And he, I mean, he had had 2002s in the past. His last one was a 72 TII. And I think it left in like 92 or something. But when I was learning to drive and looking for what car to get, I was starting to get into the hobby more. So I joined these forums as like a 15-year-old. And then uh, 
my dad said, well, what kind of car do you want to get? What cool car? And I said, I'm not sure. And he said, you should look at one of those old BMWs because I used to have them and love them. So he turned me on to it. And I found, we found the 2002 on Craigslist and it was in Venice Beach, parked on the street. And it was not that expensive compared mm-hmm. to how they are now. So he thought it would be a good car to learn to drive on because it was slow compared to new vehicles. And it's relatively safe in the sense that, you know, this got crumple zones and it's not a Lotus. Um, you know, they actually designed it with some crash testing in mind. So, yeah, yeah, that was the one. We got that car and I haven't let go of it. Thank goodness. Oh, wow. Well, that's what a story. I mean, so if I may ask, Matt, how old are you now? I'm going to be 32 in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So it's a long-term relationship, I would say. It is, which, you know, it, it weirds people out because, you know, I'm I'm still relatively young, but I've had that car over half my life. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say. You mentioned also the internet. So how had, has the internet influenced your automotive knowledge? Was it through games first or were it like, as you said, forums? So if you remember, how got this all started? You know, I was never a big gamer, mm-hmm. so I didn't play a lot of any racing or car video game. But yeah, I think joining the um, the forums and, and learning the social aspect of the hobby, the internet gave me that. Then I think as time went on, people started divulging more technical expertise. Mm-hmm. And that's where I really started to learn, you know, number one, how to do some of these repairs and how to keep these cars going on the, you know, on the road. And then I also used the internet to buy and sell parts, which was, you know, great. That's the reason why I have my, my car has a five speed and a limited slip in it. Oh, wow. You know, it's because somebody posted it on the internet, on the forum. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure I, I've looked at old Roundell magazines and you can see people advertising stuff like this, but I think the internet opened up to a greater volume, right? Anybody could log in and, you know, be a part of the hobby. I mean, look at the videos threatened us here in, in YouTube and or Jason with all his stuff. I mean, it's so beautiful to see and to listen. And I think this is actually the first time we speak about this, who people of your generation, young people, got into or used the internet for their hobby. Did you also use it for the musical side, like for the musician part in your life? You know, I was in a band at the time, you know, back in high school and college, commuting to practice in the 2002, mind you, with my bass guitar and amp and everything. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we had recorded a few albums and we were putting them on the internet, but we were still burning CDs and sending them in the mail too. Yeah. Now, I feel like if we had a second shot now, if our band was a band at this time, you know, and the and this, the music scene was where it was and that kind of music was still, you know, the popular kind, I probably would be a musician right now. I mean, this it's so much easier, I feel like, to get your stuff heard. Um, yeah. If I could go back in time and try and, you know, be more of a musician, I probably might want to do that. So you said you played the bass, right? So if yeah. you would dis- describe your car, the uh, 2002 in disguise, I would say, with no offense. Now, the 2002, <laughs> what song would it be if, it, if that car would have been a song? Oh, wow. That's such a good question. You know, you know what I actually could describe it? It's uh, Hooked on a Feeling, Blue Sweet. You know that song? I, I I think I know it. I'm just not 100% sure, but uh, I don't want you to sing it to us. So, um, right, because we might have some copyright issues. Yeah, <laughs> we will look We will look it definitely up. But describe the song a bit to those who might not know it. A lot of people will know it because it was used in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, the, the newer Marvel movie. Yes. But it's it's an older song, right? I think it's from the 70s. But I think if, if that song were released in 2021... That would have been, you know, a top 40 song because it's yes. pretty catchy and it definitely seems like it's more ahead of its time. And it's actually somewhat technical, too, even though you'd never know because it's a you know nice pop song. Yeah. But uh, just like a 2002, very ahead of its time. Yes. Very well constructed, I think. And, and also I would add anything really by Stevie Wonder I would put in this category as well. Why would you say so? Why would you do that? Because Stevie Wonder wrote these amazing pop songs that were incredibly technical, but nobody knew it until yeah. you actually dove into it and looked at, you know, the rhythms and the syncopation and then some of those chord progressions. Those songs were revolutionary. 
way yeah. before there. I mean, they were perfect at the time, but the technical aspect of them was so, you know, out of the box, I think. But they were attractive, fun pop songs, right? Yes, of course. And I mean, a 2002 is, you know, people look at it and they say, oh, it looks so cute. And the, the proportions are just right. But if you really dive in deep, I have I happen to have this right next to me. OK, this is total chance that this is next to me. In my okay. hand is a, uh, do you want me to describe this? Yes, please. We have to because there's no video. So we have to. That's right. Yeah, there's no video. In my hand is the um, vent window knob for a 2002. So the, the quarter window, the little triangle window that opens up, right? This is the knob that you twist to open that window. Yes. And I have this here because my the one in my car broke. So my friend sent me one of these. So it's a really nice design. Obviously, you can't see where this would attach to the car. It's flat with a you know kind of chrome circle on it. But if you flip it around, there's yes. a hole in the back. And you're meant to put a tool in that hole so you can poke out the flush cover, which would then expose the screw, which would then take the knob off. So it's just really clever, thoughtful things like that. Like the interior is not going to have this random screw or this hole showing that will tell you how to take the knob off. We're going to make it nice and sleek. It's, you know, obviously a, you know, simple design. It's just a knob, but there's this secret little mechanism in the back that was designed so that you, you know, were able to remove this knob without making it look like your car was a parts car. Yeah. And that's like Stevie Wonder right there, right? Beautiful, elegant pop song, but you'd never know that he's got these chromatic chord progressions that, you know, are kind of revolutionary. Seriously, that's a very light, uh, lovely uh, comparison. It makes total sense what you said. I'm happy I came up with that answer. That was <laughs> yeah, no, very, very nice. So, I mean, if you look at the 2002 and I like the 1602 and the 1600 and all these kind of things, I mean, this was a breakthrough for BMW. They just introduced the Neue Klasse, right? So they, they take all the components into that and uh, really lovely. But then also the kind of, how you say it, can you say this, fandom this car mm -hmm. has. How are people reacting when you stop by in a 2002 on the roads in California? Where exactly are you? Are you in Los Angeles? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I am maybe a few miles from LAX airport. So yeah. kind of near the beach, but you know, close enough to the city. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, it, I mean it's you, a beach you car. You drive this small, tiny car. Yeah, exactly. It is, right? Mm -hmm. You can see it definitely with a surfboard on, on the roof. Yeah. And you know what? Mine has like a faded paint job up on the roof too. So it'd probably be perfect with a surfboard. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so you try to keep the car in, in like a, not abandoned, but like a well-aged condition? It's in, we call it patina. It's yes. in good patina shape. And it is it is all natural patina. I will say that. I mean, when I got the car, somebody had painted it in the past with a clear coat. So, you know, originally they were single stage paint. So somebody repaints it the blue, paints it a nice clear on top. So yeah. it, it actually shines up really nice, but it was sitting outside. So a lot of that clear cone on the roof kind of went away. And I, I know it would look better shiny, but I love that it's kind of like worn in and weathered. Yeah. Um, I do want to fix the body rust at some point. It does have a little bit of rust bubbles in the rocker panels. No, can't um, be. It's a BMW. No, 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 no. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't <laughs> yeah. possibly be. I mean, luckily the be. car's a California car. Yeah. So, I mean, it has a, this is a thing in California, but it has a, an original black plate. So meaning that it's been registered in this state for its entire existence. Is that the black with the yellow uh, letters on it? Correct. Yeah. They look which so sexy. Which anybody can get now. They, okay. They're, they're the coolest looking plate, which is why people get them now because they reissued them. Uh. But my particular plate has been on there since 69 and it looks like it has. So I remember back in, what was it, like 2009 or something, I remember somebody telling me, you should restore your license plate. And I said, why would I do that? And now I'm so glad I didn't do that. Yeah. Because it it's an original condition. And I have the front one too. The front plate is on the front bumper. Yeah. Nice. But because it's a black plate California car and it's not a car from a place where they put salt on the roads, it doesn't rust, you know, through the floor, bottom up. It's really a top down rust here. Yeah. Okay. That's so. I think manageable. Yeah, I mean, it's it's still a solid car. I just drove it up to San Francisco. Nice. So you really use the car, right? Yeah. Honestly, I prefer to drive it more than anything. Yeah. It's I just, at this point, the only times I don't want to use this when I have to, like, you know, park it on the street 
for you know several hours, then I get nervous because it, it's it's not like there's going to be an issue, but I have such a sentimental attachment to it yeah. that if something did happen, I'd be worried. No, obviously, I mean, this car is, is more than 15 years with you and you learn driving on it and all these kind of uh, fantastic memories. And I think, you know, first of all, everyone can do whatever they want to with their cars. I just got back from uh, Rotslav, which is in Poland, from a tuning festival called Alt Race. And, um, you know, I was going there with, to be honest, with a very arrogant attitude. Oh, tuners, I mean, come on, please. Like right. angled wheels <laughs> and all this shit. No, please. So, and I have to say, 98% of the cars I disliked. That's for sure. But that's my personal taste. I like 100% the people who were there because mm -hmm. they were so inclusive. There was no one saying, okay, you drive a Honda. Okay, I don't want to talk to you. Hey, cool. You did this to your car. Or there was this BMW and our friends, the Hofmeisters. I don't know if you heard about the Hofmeisters. I think I have, yeah. Yeah, this is this uh, German club, in a sense of a club, loose club of uh, enthusiasts for BMWs. And then, of course, regarding to the, in, in relation to the designer, Mr. Hofmeister and the Hofmeister band and they called themselves Hofmeister. So they were also there. We had a stand and also Rennmeister, our project from Jägermeister had a stand there. And it was so cool because Hofmeisters with the help of BMW Group Classic, they brought a real M1 Pro car Ooh. and we, and they decorated everything like an open air living room, like with sofas, vintage lamps hanging around, like a little couch table, all these kind of things. So around the car? Around the car, exactly. So okay. we were sitting sitting there and looking at the car while having a coffee. It was fantastic. That's cool. And the cool thing is, so because this alt race is super international. I mean, there were people from Germany going to Poland. There were people from the UK. Americans were also there. Japan, everyone. It's really like the tuning festival, I would say. Yeah. And so many young people below 20 came to the stand of the Hofmeisters and were asking... Wow, this car looks so fantastic. What base is it, is it on? So what did you do to it? And they have to wow. say, no, listen, that's an original M1 Pro car. So that is a race car. This is wow, true. That is sheer. And they said, really? They built that in that time? I need to look it up. So I need to jump back into the 80s because they were born in the mid 90s or the 2000s and now I've been in their 20s. So I really love that atmosphere. So I, when I said I didn't like 98% of the cars, that's my personal taste. I like 100% of the people who were there because they yeah. were so cool. And if you decide to leave your car with a bit of rust on the bumper, I think it's only fair because that's your taste and this is what cars are for. They are a cultural object. And look at your story. I mean, you comp you were able to compare a car with a song, right? <laughs> Try this with the KitchenAid, yeah. right? I mean, what... Oh, you haven't seen my blender yet, have uh, you? Of course. I, I knew that that was coming. <laughs> uh, for those tuning in, we have to say, Matt has a wonderful old fridge, but it was, so, it was so noisy that our sound engineer, Alex, was kindly asking to switch it off, and you did. So I could imagine if that cool fridge is there in your apartment, then I don't want to see the blender because I get jealous because I don't have... I don't have no, any, I, only modern I'm one. I'm just kidding. Okay, I don't really good. Have, yeah, good. I don't have a modern one. <laughs> good. No, there's um, limits. Yes, <laughs> of course. Of course, they are. <laughs> but tell me, Matt, what makes it really to you? So, it did it only started with the approach of your father saying, "Okay, it's going to be safe, not too quick," or was it also your decision to go for 2002? Yeah, I mean, I like the design. I like the idea of having something classic. Yeah. You know, I think I hadn't even driven in one. I think I drove in one before we found mine. And I think, you know, my dad was probably an enabler and he kind of secretly wanted another one for himself and thought, well, this is a way to do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, looking back on it now as a teenager in that car, like you, I, I learned to be a better driver, I think, with it too. Yes. Because you're, the sensations are all very present. You know exactly where every corner of the car is. And everything is also built to scale. Yeah. Right? It feels like the right size. Even yeah. though on the outside, it's not a huge car. It's like, you know, a normal size car. And on the inside, it feels big. Even though it's, you know, not that big of a car. So um, it is incredibly Germanic, I think. I think we also have, for those who not live in the States or do their license in the States, you're, at your time, when were you allowed to do your driving license? 
So you get your, in the state of California, at least, you get your learner's permit at 15. Mm -hmm. And then you can take your driver's test at 16. Okay. And you're supposed to log a certain amount of hours of practice. Yes. Where somebody's in the car with you. Your friends can be in there too. You have to have one licensed driver in the vehicle with you. And you're supposed to like write down the log. But yeah. this is the US. There's nobody actually tracking that. Yeah. So no, <laughs> nobody does that. They just get their permit. Maybe they'll do a couple of practice sessions and then they'll just go take tests. Yeah. My dad actually made me log it and we did practice sessions we had a there's a little it's actually not far away from here a little industrial area on the weekends was empty mm -hmm. actually rivian is has an office there now so it's not empty on the weekends yeah um not anymore no actually they have 24 7 security too which is a yeah. bummer because i used to go nuts in that area yeah. but <laughs> we would go to that little loop and it was like a little racetrack kind of thing yeah. we i wasn't driving super fast but it, it was a way for me to practice shifting gears starting and stopping right there was a little hill we could find my dad would take me to a like a, a driveway incline mm -hmm. and he would say i want you to go up and down the driveway just using the clutch and the gas so i would yes. just go up and down and up and down probably burning the clutch up but whatever and so i did that for uh, probably about a year and we logged it in a book and then i went to go take my driver's test in the 2002 so you have to basically drive i think they make you drive a mile and then you have okay. to to reverse <laughs> You have to signal, obviously, and do all that. Yeah. You have to reverse next to a curb for 20 feet yes. for some reason. <laughs> uh, it's a really, like, it's <laughs> one of the biggest gripes that car enthusiasts, I think, have with our system is it's way too easy to get a driver's license. And then you never have to take a retest. Yeah. So, you know, the way of doing it over in your neck of the woods makes more sense. We need people to be better drivers here, and they're just not. But I did it in the 2002. I did it driving stick. The turn signal's on the right side, which is unusual, so I made sure to tell the person. Yes. I didn't know this until later, but the speedometer wasn't accurate. Okay. And it was reading <laughs> much too fast. So I remember if I was doing like, let's say 10 miles an hour, it would read 20. <laughs> So I would, every time I would drive and there was a speed limit sign, it would yeah. say 25 and I would like visibly, I would point to it. I would say 25 and I would put the speedometer yeah. at like 23, yeah. but we were really going like 12. <laughs> so, but the tester, they didn't know, you know, they, they had no idea. They're just doing their job. So they looked at yeah. the speedo and said, well, he's going into the speed limit. So I guess yeah. that counts. So I was going painfully slow, but the car said I was going the speed yeah. limit. So... I still got the, I got the license. Yeah, no, um, of course. But then later I got the speedo calibrator. I realized, oh crap, I was going really slow on that test. Yeah. I had no idea. It, I hope it, it didn't make you nervous driving on real speed then later on. Um, well, I just followed traffic. Yeah, I mean, that's, Nobody, that's the best I thing mean, you can do. Yeah, and, and here there's always traffic and, and like people generally follow speed limits, but yeah. not really. They're close, but no, it's a shame, really. You know, I have to say, when I'm in driving the States, a rental, going over for the Monterey week or whatever mm -hmm. reason, but that's like the most recent thing, I really, really stick to the speed limit, 100%. Smart. Because, I mean, first of all, for us, it's crazy that you on a highway can overtake on both sides. That makes it a bit insecure because mm -hmm. on our side of the planet, it's just overtake on the left never on the right right and that's the rule by doing the driving tests and also driving lessons that what they hammer into your head and it's actually if you overtake on the right it has compared to other things very harsh fines for that so really uh, yeah it's it's crazy so for everyone from the states coming to germany or switzerland and drive on the autobahn don't overtake on the right hand side never ever there is mm -hmm. one exception if there's a traffic jam and you are on the right lane and that yours is free, then you can go, to, I think it's 10 kilometers faster than the, the other traffic on the other lane. But anyway, I, I'm not sure that my driving test is a long time ago. So and I, I for really those know. listening in the States, please do this also. Yeah, it would be nice. It's not, I mean, when you're on some of these interstates, like if you, like I, when I just drove to San Francisco, most yeah. of that road is two to three lane. Yeah. And people just kind of, they just do what they want. But it would be a much more cohesive and, you know, pleasant driving experience if everybody actually bought in to exactly. this idea. Absolutely. No, I just, got, I just got yesterday back from Munich, so Munich, Zurich, by car. And especially in Switzerland, the rules are like, 
I mean, the one thing you don't want to do is get caught speeding in Switzerland. I mean, mm. it goes that far if you if you overstep a certain amount of over above the speed limit, they take the car away from you, and they don't ask if it's a rental. They don't care. Do they really? They take it away from you. So here's right. a question then. Yes. If, let's say you wanted to, you know, exploit your Ferrari yes. in a country like Switzerland. Besides a racetrack, where else do you do that? Uh, Is there actually like, like, could you take it up to the Alps and you, you wouldn't you have an issue up there? If, if you stick to the speed limit of a B route or like a country road, which is 80 kilometers an hour, no problem. If you're over it, problem. 80 kilometers, that's fast yeah. enough. I don't know. Ah. That's, for me, that's fast enough. But, yeah. you know. I think the scenery, the scenery, elevation change, right? The the type of route and the twists and turns, that stuff matters more than just outright speed. I mean, but yes. but I think also the fun part in, you know, a fun car is some of these turns, you don't have to slow down as much, right? You can yeah. take them with a little bit more momentum, but you're still not going an unsafe speed. Absolutely not. It just no. feels like it. You just feel like a race yeah. car driver when really you're not. So, Matt, what is your opinion about modern cars? I mean, look at the BMW M2. It comes still with a stick, has, of course, more power. So that might be a good uh, successor to your 2002. Not that you need to sell it, but, I mean, it is a good successor. You know, I think that's probably true, but it's so much more than that now that it's... Those cars are just so fast. I mean, and it's crazy to me that like there's an M8 that, yeah. you know, <laughs> is faster than the M2. Like I, yes. I have a buddy with an M2 and it's a rocket ship. I mean, yes. then, you know, whatever electric thing comes next is like going to be even faster. Like these, we're making time machines now. We're not yeah. making cars anymore. And um, in terms of uh, what the future will bring also, like in, when you said that they are time machines and I agree they are. There was an interesting talk in Munich with Adrian van Hoydonk, who is the head of design of the BMW Group. Mm -hmm. That means that he oversees all brands and design developments of whatever there is. And afterwards was a Q&A and um, it was in a car club. And one question was, so what do you think about autonomous driving? So I could not believe that people would love to do that, right? And he said a very clever and smart thing. And he looked at the person asking the question saying, Tell me, this day, how many minutes, when you drive one hour, how many minutes are you playing with your phone? You are on the phone, or you, you try to find the right the radio channel or the right music? Try to find out how many minutes of 60 minutes driving you really focus on driving. So, and I think it's very important to mention that it's always an option. So if I want to go out and have fun, I drive my car. If I right. just want to commute between Santa Barbara and Los Angeles, or if, if I don't know if you can say that, right? Yeah. Then yeah. I just sit down and the car does all the things and I, I start my emails, have a coffee or whatever, right? Oh, yeah. That so, sounds I great. mean, sometimes driving is also, let's face it, and I think I get uh, lots of comments, negative comments on what I'm going to say now. Let's face it, sometimes driving is not fun at all. It's not. It's right? not. So, I totally agree. So especially I think, here too, especially yeah, in Los Angeles. It, everywhere, uh, Matt, well, yeah. everywhere, like, you know, <laughs> everywhere. It's not, it's, it's sometimes not fun. It can be fun, especially if you hang out with friends, you go to events and stuff like that. Right. And you go to some fun places. Exactly. And let's speak about some fun places because what's always interesting and what I try always uh, in, in our podcast is to share the different cultures, automotive cultures in the regions where our guests are. So you live in California more precisely in Los Angeles. So we had the guys from Vintage Bimmer on our podcast yeah, as well. Those guys are great. Yeah, they are really fantastic. So are you part of that like of that scene of that culture or do you do your own thing in a sense? I would think I am part of the culture and it kind of just happened that way. There are many weekends where I just kind of do my own thing and just hang out with my friends, but we have a group here called SoCal Vintage BMW. They started in 2007, yes. and I say we because it was started by two guys, John Barlow and Jeff Devanzo. Jeff, unfortunately, passed away. Um, mm -hmm. We're very sad about that. Yes. So we needed somebody to help you know, fill in some of the responsibilities, and I'm friends with John, so now I help to run SoCal Vintage BMW. 
which is kind of crazy. So mm-hmm. I run a lot of the drive events that we do. So we do one a month in the summer months typically, and we we partner with, you know, usually an independent repair shop that wants yep. to host us. We'll make a drive route. So actually this coming Saturday, which actually is going to be passed by the time this this airs, we're doing a mountain drive and a big barbecue with a shop down in San Diego area. Nice. So from that respect, I am, you know, part of the culture in that sense. Um, I help lead these events and, you know, people in the vintage BMW community know me. I'm also a member of uh, kind of like a motoring social club. They call it the motoring club here in mm-hmm. West Los Angeles. And it's not just BMWs. It's, you know, cars of all types. Uh, although there's a lot of Porsches calling you people out. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we hang out, we watch F1 races together. We'll do cars and coffee. We'll go on drives. You know, it's also like a co-working office. So we'll all hang out and, you know, work yeah. during the week. But sometimes I just want to go for a drive by myself or maybe one or two friends. Yeah. We'll go drive to Malibu and we'll go get coffee and come back. Um, there's got to be a healthy balance. Yeah. I mean, I love that. So it, let's speak a bit about uh, uh, so cal- uh, sorry, that's a tongue twister for me. So called vintage BMW, right? So cal, you got so cool. Yeah, so cal, SoCal, Southern California, Southern California vintage BMW. You have an Instagram channel, so everyone tuning in and uh, you want to join, join these guys because absolutely fantastic. I mean, as far as I know, the barbecue will be in La Jolla. Is it correct? Because Correct. that's what, what, what it was saying during, during my research. And I have to say, I know La Jolla quite well. And you might ask why. Because I was two times in a jury of the La Jolla Concours. So this is... Were uh, you? Oh, yes. Okay. And I really love that area. It's um, really pretty. Is uh, like If you look at the uh, SoCal uh, vintage BMWs, are you a BMW without an S? Are you uh, connected also into like over the pond? Or is it like a locally thing more i think it's hyper local i mean we certainly have an online presence where people from overseas you know message actually there's a guy i can't remember his name but a guy from i want to say he's from germany who messaged the the socal vintage bmw page and he the instagram and he asked me he said i'm going to be in los angeles from this state to this state i would love to shoot an old bmw you know photograph so we we you know we do get some people messaging us but it is, it's a pretty hyper local yeah. thing. I mean, we host our events. We have our big event in November and then we kind of take a break over the winter. Yeah. And, you know, we try and celebrate all that is having a BMW here in SoCal, which is yeah. one of the greatest places to go driving. It, that's true. Absolutely. It's so diverse. You have mountains, you have uh, like direct access to the Pacific, everything, right? Yeah. It's everything. Is I can there. see the mountains right there. Like yeah. they're right out my window right now is, is where the mountains that we go driving. I mean, that's pretty special. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, LA itself also very nice. I think I've fr- I heard somebody describe it as it's a bunch of little main streets with suburbs connected through little canyons. Right. Like yeah. to me, for, for to get to, you know, even to get to like where my grandma lives, I have to drive through a protected swampland that has some twisty roads in it. Yeah. But I'm in a, you know, a city. It's concrete and everything. Yes. And just to get to the other side, I'm going through this like little nature preserve. Yeah. And that's just everywhere. But then you'll get to that section of town and the architecture is all different. You know, the roads are narrower or wider or whatever, and the food is different everywhere. I mean, culturally, this is a spectacular place. Yeah. Matt, how does a perfect day off look like for Matt Schwartz? I mean, the perfect day off is a drive up the coast. You know, I want to factor in some exercise in there. So maybe it's a drive to go hike. Yeah. So go for a drive, morning time, 8 a.m., right? Yeah. Get a little hike in there, right? Now it's about 10 a.m., traffic's starting to hit. Stop, go get a burrito, because that's what we love. We love to have breakfast burritos here. Precious um, thing, I would say. Yeah? Nah, I mean, we don't have that culture. I loved it. Yeah, the burritos here. Um, And then, what, by, you know, noon, it'd be good to maybe turn a wrench, right? Work on a yeah. project or something like that. Create some glasses. Create some glass. Yeah, actually, it's pretty soon. That's going to be taking that slot. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's not. But uh, once we're through this product development. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I actually wrestle with this all the time because I always have a project to fix yeah. at the moment and I, and I like desperately want to finish them. But I'm wondering, what am I going to do in that spot when, when I don't need to do the project anymore? Yeah. That's what I need to figure out. So okay. if anybody has feedback, please message me. <laughs> so everyone, this is a Classic Heart, the BMW Group Classic Podcast. Support this gentleman, Matt Schwartz, <laughs> in getting feedback and information. So um, we will definitely forward, if we receive something, we will definitely forward <laughs> it. Because we have quite an active community, I have to say. Um, so my question to you is, when you say you want to go hiking, where would you go hiking? So what is your favorite place to drive and hike? Oof. I mean, I I like hiking, and, and by hiking I mean like going for a walk in nature, and yeah. not one of these like putting on big hiking boots and taking a big okay, backpack yeah, and whatever. Fair. Right? There's a big difference there. Yeah. You know, it's like going for a nice walk in nature. There's a place called Palos Verdes here. Yeah. Which is actually on the southern end of uh, LA County, and it's basically just like a big hilly region. But most of the the trails, you get this expansive ocean view. Wow. Um. And you can get lost in little wooded areas too, but you're effectively on the side of a hill looking down at the ocean. And that's probably my favorite place to drive also mm -hmm. because it's a little bit less crowded than Malibu, which is yep. you know where most of the good driving roads are here. Yeah. So I'd probably be down in Palos Verdes. Yeah. And then what's your secret uh, burrito place? Oh, I can't say that. Then everybody's going to know. Okay. Uh, you know, it's just between us. Well, actually, lately, this is new, th not new thing, but this thing in L.A. where people can get a permit and they could just pop up on the side of the street with a yep. hot plate. Have you seen this? No. So they don't have this. I assume they don't have this kind of concept over there. Maybe they, they do, but it's probably more established. But here, you know, these random roads are, you know, five to six lane highways. Yeah. And people just pop up a tent, a hot plate, some lights, and uh, they'll start making tacos al pastor or burritos or, you know, whatever you want. And it's like typically cash only kind of place. So like any yeah. place like that where you can just walk up and they just make it for you immediately. Yeah, that's my place. So that's the new kind of food truck without a truck. It's basically, yeah, it's effectively a food truck without a truck, but they're yeah. permanent fixtures. Like there's one next to my apartment. They're there Wednesday through Sunday. Oh, wow. Cool. I mean, that was like, we touched so many fields. I love that. But there's one final question I would like to ask you. So what is the one thing you looking most forward to this year? I actually have a very easy answer for this. My family and I are going to the Goodwood Revival in the UK. Seriously? Yeah. So we can catch up there because I will be there around there. 100% You'll be there. as well. Yes, 100%. Okay. Okay, good to know. We saw that uh, apparently Lotus is doing some 75th anniversary thing. Yes. So I have to give credit to my amazing mom. I sent her the article about the Lotus thing. I said, this is cool. They're doing an event at Goodwood. And she said, okay, let's go. Why don't we go? Yeah, you know, your mom worked, so, at, a, worked at an agency. She knows how to, how to do things like that. She does. She does. Credit right. to her. She's great. Yes. But we're going to go to the Goodwood Revival. That's, that's what I'm most excited for automotive-wise this year. Perfect. And so getting my dad's Lotus done. That's of course, the other thing. of course. Five years in the making, we're almost done. Mega. Matt, thank you very much for spending the early morning at your place. Uh, stop by at your burrito place now. <laughs> Have a burrito on us and enjoy this. Thank you very much for joining this little conversation, mainly about uh, 2002s, but I think we touched also many, many other fields. Thank you very much for this. And my favorite is still the part of what song would be your 2002 in disguise. Thank you for the conversation. Thanks for including me and having me and, uh, you know, letting us chat about all this cool stuff. And thank you also much. Open our eyes for the uh, Southern California car culture. And um, thanks also to Alexander and to Frederica, uh, who are part of our team here. And um, also, if you guys like what you hear on uh, our little podcast, subscribe to not miss any future episode. And if you like, leave a comment, leave tips and hints for Matt and uh, for his new business. And Matt, I can't wait to see your new glasses. That's very exciting. Thank you. I, I hope I get to launch them soon. I'll, I'll definitely ping you about them. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks so much, Sean.